loud. Okay, and then let's prepare to go live on Facebook. Next. Come on. <laughs> it's thinking hard. Come on. <laughs> It says I go live on Facebook. What's going on? What's going on? All right, let's try this again. Sorry, I don't know what the heck is going on. Oh, it says it's recording live. Right, but where is it? Oh, good question. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Um, Probably just. Uh, okay, here, stop even. live stream. Start it again. Okay, more live on Facebook. Yeah. No. What I want to share to my group, not where are you? God damn. <laughs> okay, no, it went, it went to the wrong place. It keeps going to my Facebook page. So we're, we're doing it again. I apologize for all you folks who are hanging out, waiting for this to go. It normally doesn't have this issue. So I really appreciate your patience. No problem. We'll get there. Okay, I want to share to a group. you there we go there's our group next almost Here we go. Design in detail with Cliff. I just posted a comment that. Thanks, that we're, that we're working, working on, on it. Thanks. Patience. <laughs> we're getting there. Okay. Uh, There's quite a few people joining. Yay, good, I'm glad you're letting him in. Sorry, yep. I'm just trying to spell your name right, Cliff, so bear with Thank me. Thank you. Yeah, Thank no you. worries. <laughs> hey, Nancy. Oh, man, there we go. Um, where are we in the book? Are we on the... I still don't see anything on Facebook yet. It's spinning. It's setting up your meeting with Facebook Live. It's working on it. Okay. It's 
Yeah, I have a notification that says it's streaming live on Facebook now. Okay. Um, Rochelle J is now live. Um, can you see us, guys? I, I can see you on Facebook. Yep, yeah, there we go. I can see us on Facebook. So we are ready. Take it away, Maggie. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, Maggie Thompson here, president of the board for our Upper Midwest Beat Society. This is our March 1st member meeting. And I want to just take a couple of moments to update everybody um, on what's been going on. Um, and I want to, last year, the board got our Zoom meetings going. Oops, here we go. I'm admitting people, sorry. We'll go back to camera here. Last year, um, the, the board meeting got our, our uh, board got our Zoom meetings organized and running. And I wanted to uh, say kudos to last year's board for doing that because there were quite a few beat societies around the country that um, effectively disbanded because they couldn't get going with the, with the right online services. Um, so big round of applause to last year's board of directors. Uh, and you know who you are out there. So thank you. Uh, and that's leading up to secondly, we have just completed another one of our online goals, um, which is that now we have PayPal set up uh, and we're invoicing our members through PayPal. Uh, and it's going to become our preferred method of payment, but not the only one. So if you still prefer to pay by check and mail it in, no problem. We'll be accepting that for as long as anybody chooses to do that. Um, so, um, and, and that was uh, a goal that we had for the last couple of months and we've reached that goal. And so many of you have probably received your PayPal invoice for this year's membership just in the last week. And uh, in addition, thank you to everybody who's paid right away. Uh, but I also wanna emphasize that uh, if you haven't paid, please pay before the end of March. That's our cutoff period. Um, and we want you to stay as uh, an active member of our group so that uh, you can continue to be in our monthly meetings on our uh, Facebook page. And um, you'll also continue to get our newsletter and um, yeah, monthly meeting. Okay, reading my all my little notes here. So I got all three of those though. So. Uh, and we're also working on ramping up more of our online presence for the rest of this year. Uh, and I won't say anything more specific about that because I don't want to, you know, leave everybody hanging. But we each month I'll update you on, on what we've done, what's in the works, and where we're going. Uh, but we really want to get, um, and part of that process, of course, is getting our web page updated and keeping it updated um, completely. Um, so, oh, and uh, and Rochelle wants me to be sure and mention that we will be, she will be creating events on our Facebook pages, both the public one and the private member page for all of the events that we're gonna be offering throughout each month. So be sure you stay tuned. Um, and I think that's all I have to say. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Rochelle and thank you all for listening to my update. I'll let you know what happens next. Hi everyone, I'm Rochelle. Um, you obviously know me from Bobby Bead and Team Toho. So we do have a fun promotion that we are doing for our um, Upper Midwest Bead Society, um, just our bead society. We've got five Toho Challenge kits to give away and it's just to our members. So anybody that would like to um, still get a Toho Challenge mini kit, I'm going to be posting on our public UMBS page 
um, a post that I would like you to post a picture of something that you did this year, something you made in this last pandemic year um, on the post, a picture of something you made. It doesn't have to have Toho beads, but it'd be great if it did. But I just wanna see what you did this year even if you made anything, you made a flower bouquet, you made a cake, I don't care. Send me a picture of something you did on our post and then we'll put your name in the hat for the drawing for the five challenge kits that we have to give away. And then at our next meeting on April 5th, um, we will announce our five winners. So we've got kits to give away. Um, for anybody who wants to be in the challenge and you don't even have to pay for shipping. The Bead Society will even pay for the shipping for the kit. So this is a real win-win for any member. So look for the post. I will post it later after the meeting tonight. So it'll be there later and you'll have all month long to post. So if you haven't made anything yet this year, then you've got one month to make something too and post me a picture. And so, we will then look forward to announcing our winners next month. And so, um, but until then, we've got Cliff Swain Solomon and his design in detail. And boy, is this definitely in detail. This is the in-depth of all of it. So take it away, Cliff. Got you. Are we gonna do Maxine first? I'll just step right in. Okay. So I wanted to tell my usual one, one half a second joke. There were <clears throat> these fellows that were at a- We forgot the a, joke. Um, what? Somebody. Fellows were at a monastery and they had a vow of silence, and, but that one monk could talk once a year. So the, the date came and this monk said, I love, the mashed potatoes. That was it. Another year passed and another monk got an opportunity to talk and he said, I think the mashed potatoes are lumpy. Another year passed and another monk got a chance to talk and he said, I wish they made the, the mashed potatoes with milk. Another year passed and the fourth monk gets to talk and he says, I can't stand the bickering. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was cute. Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Cliff Swain Solomon. Uh, I'm a bead designer. I teach um, through basically um, all over the world at this point. Um, and have really enjoyed meeting all of you through Zoom. It's been quite an adjustment. Um, but I wanted to spend today with you all talking a little bit about my design process, which is a little bit different than um, some other artists. And I'm hoping it inspires you. I'm hoping that it um, creates some conversation. And um, afterwards, if you have any questions, you'll be able to ask me and I'll also give you my email. So that way, if you guys, you know, day from now have some questions, want some follow up, um, you can feel free to contact me. But um, that said, I'm going to switch the screen over. You're going to see a little box with my face on it most of the time. And the rest of the time, you're going to see some pretty pictures um, in the background. So let me get set up here. And there we go. You guys should be seeing a big screen that says design in detail with some pictures. Are we good? Okay, um, so today as we're, as I'm going through this, we're gonna go over everything from where do you find inspiration? Um, how do you bring that inspiration to life? Um, everything from patterning it to choosing your beads, your colors, and of course I can't fit everything into an hour talk here, but um, that's why I said if you have questions later, please go ahead um, and ask, but um, why don't you just start with that? All my pieces start with a question, which is what's inspiring me today? And why does it need to be made out of beads? If you think about it, beading takes an awful lot of time. It's not, you know, paintings can take years as well, but in general, I can take a piece of some paint and do a very large area pretty quickly if I wanted to. 
beads, not so much. So when we're choosing to do a beading project, what is it about this project that's gonna draw me to it? Maybe it's just something beautiful to adorn my wrist, something to make for a friend, but many times there might be something a little bit deeper um, behind it. This is the piece I did for Toho for last year for their bead challenge. And um, I have a description of it up there. And really what I was seeing is it was just after the wildfires in Australia I was um, seeing on the news about the wildlife and what they were going through. And so this piece was really inspired by that. And as I started beating it, a deeper meaning came up for me. Um, there was a story that I heard where some of the badgers um, were actually letting other animals into their den. It wasn't that they were ushering them in, but they weren't kicking them out that they would normally be at odds with. And I said, isn't that a beautiful metaphor when in crisis, rather than attacking animals that they normally would, they were helping them. And when we look at the world that we're in right now, many of us sheltering in place at home, um, thinking about COVID last year. So as I was beating this, I got pretty emotional seeing that if we all just work together, we can get through this. And that's really became my guiding force in my meditation as I worked on this, you know, it has probably around 15 or 20,000 beads in it. And so each bead one at a time, that was my intention as I was beading. Um, and if I felt myself getting a little strained, a little burned out, I'd step back and focus on why am I doing this? And it really kept me going. And so whenever I bead, that's where I start is why am I doing this? Um, what is it about this? And sometimes, again, it's just something as simple as I think this, the beads are pretty and I just want that on my wrist. Other times I'll look at inspirations from my childhood, advertisements. Um, I designed these earrings after the old Coke commercials in the eighties. Um, they're a little tribute there to Max Hedrum, but I'll look at advertisements for colors, different color combinations, schemes, shapes. And so you can see that captured here um, between the ad and the earrings themselves. Sometimes there's a focal that I really like and I'm inspired and I was at a gem show and I saw this Larimar and it was the first time I'd ever seen Larimar um, this pristine. It looked like little pools of water. And as I studied it, um, seeing the different swirls and shapes in it, whoops, go back one here. Okay, um, seeing the different shapes and colors I um, said, you know, this reminds me of the different whirlpools in the water, splashes of waves, and recreated the um, through the piece. And one of the things, this was my very first embroidery piece I ever did. So every element of it was something with water for me. So freshwater pearls. Um, the backing is made out of toad leather. Um, so every every element of this dealt with water, even the leather um, for it. Um, the Toho Challenge, uh, the year before last, I also did a piece for, and when I got the kit for it, I noticed all the colors reminded me of a piece that I saw that Monet had done at his, of his garden in Giverny. And, um, I was at the, um, at Ohio at a art gallery there visiting my in-laws and saw this piece. And I said, that basically is the same color as the beads. So I talked to a good lapidary friend of mine. She had that, um, the focal is actually made out of petrified bog wood and um, went perfectly with the beads, had her um, uh, polish it up, cut it to shape for me. And that became my piece for Toho, but again, inspired by an art piece that I had seen. And sometimes it's not as serious as this. And um, the next piece that I uh, wanted to bring up is um, this piece I call Perlesque was inspired by two different things. Um, first is uh, growing up, we would go to the Hollywood Bowl with my grandparents in Southern California to see the symphony. And this repetition of all the different circles, all the ball shapes that they use for acoustics on their ceiling. And um, simultaneously, um, this, uh, the burlesque dancers of the 1920s. So I wanted to bring together the kind of the flapper dresses, the burlesque, the tassels, um, combined with all the different repeating circles of different shapes. And um, these earrings were born. 
Sometimes I'll design things in a series and it allows me to see my growth as an artist. The piece on the left, um, I designed after visiting a garden and there was these beautiful wisteria um, just hanging down, just dancing. And again, going with that kind of fringy flapper dress feel, um, I wanted to recreate that. And when I was done, I really liked the piece, but it felt very heavy compared to the lightness of the plant. So I put it aside, came back to it a little over a year later, and the piece on the bottom, I was able to recreate the vines, the twisty shapes, and incorporate a little bit more lightness, again, using the same theme. Um, the next piece was actually a challenge by an artist friend of mine. And he said, you know, a lot of your pieces, I'm seeing that you're doing a lot of peyote, a lot of herringbone, stitches that are very dense with beads. And he said, I'd love to see what you could do that's a little bit lighter. And so thinking about that, I said, well, not only do I want to go lighter, but I also want to use less beads because a lot of my projects would use, you know, 12, 15, 20, 30 different beads. And so I said, what would it be like to just limit myself to a handful of beads? In this case, I had two size 15s, a Czech Charlotte, one 11 and one size eight, and that was it. And that's what I limited myself to, some fire polish and um, some focal um, crystals as well. But as far as bead beads, that was all I was allowing myself. And um, I thought back to, and I had gone in Spain to uh, the palace in Madrid and saw the picture in the upper right-hand corner of Queen Sophia, and she was wearing a crown that was made by Cartier. And um, so I said, love the shape, love the kind of the crystal embellishments. And while I was at the castle, I also, or the palace, I also saw there was this wonderful room which is pictured on the bottom right. And all of the walls were covered in porcelain. That's not wallpaper, those aren't frescoes. It's cast porcelain that was used as wallpaper. And seeing the swagging, the lacy shapes, um, wanted to bring that in. Wanted to bring in from um, the Spanish lace that I was seeing in the costuming, the lace feel, and then going to the old Victorian where they would weave the ribbons through and recreate that all in beads. And so the piece on the left was born, combining all of that to create something a little bit lighter and lacier as I was challenged. And this piece uses 90% um, netting and Hubble stitch combined together. Um, but again, creating something a little bit lighter. Um, sometimes I look at something for a more spiritual inspiration. Uh, growing up, uh, we would go to Alvera Street, which was the birthplace of oh, Los Angeles. Street, except I can't get the volume. Um, Nothing on here says volume. Which was the birthplace of um, Los Angeles. And for that, um, during the Day of the Dead ceremonies and festivals, um, they would have the streets lined with marigolds, which were said to bring, um, guide the spirits of loved ones that had crossed over to bring them to the altars of the people so that they could visit the families on this special day in the culture. And so I wanted to recreate that childhood memory, but also that spiritual ceremony. And this is my newest. So this again captures that memory of um, being um, going to the old Alvera Street and that the spiritual ceremonies. <laughs> which leads me to my next piece, which is really going to be one of the focuses of most of this talk and the design process. Um, the very first piece I ever designed was this little fish. This was my very first creation that was all my own. And um, when I was designing him, I was making him in memory of, I had lost several loved ones in a car accident. And I made this in honor of my sister who had passed away. She loved fish. She loved a lot of Asian culture. So doing a koi fish and the single eye representing the spiritual eye that many people um, will use in different um, cultures to single eye. Um, also protection from the evil eye, they'll say a lot with these. 
So I created this piece and um, went to our, my local bead society meeting. And while I was there, um, Kate McKinnon was there that night speaking. And she asked if she could photograph the piece for her book. And mind you, this is the very first piece I'd ever made. That was my own design. And I said, well, it's not really geometric beadwork like your books. And she said, well, then make something geometric um, for it to go on. And I like, where do I start? This is my first time. And that really um, put me on my path to figuring out how to do greater, bigger designs. So I have a special process that I go through when I'm looking at the design process. And the first is I do some research. What things do I need to find out about this? Um, what are things that are characteristic of whatever I'm going to make? And sometimes learn, learn or appreciate it on a different um, level. The next thing that I'll do is sketch it out, make a drawing of it. Um, sometimes it's a mental sketch, usually it's on paper. Then I'll choose my beads. What colors do I want it to be? What different components am I gonna combine? Is it gonna have crystals? Is it gonna have fire polish beads? Is it gonna use shape beads? Um, what finishes, what hues? All these different things that are gonna be part of it. Um, what thread am I going to need? What stitches am I going to need? And once I figure all that out, that's just the planning, then I've got to pattern it. So that's what I'm going to go through with you guys today. So my research, it can include just my life experiences. You don't have to necessarily go to a library. Um, it can be going to museums. It can be going to the actual location that you're trying to capture. Let's say it's a flower in a garden. So go to that garden. Perhaps it's doing internet searches to find out um, deeper meanings of things. Um, talking to friends who are experts or people that you've never met, just you know, finding whatever resources you can. And so I start with that, but that doesn't necessarily create the piece. At this point, I've got a bunch of information, but I don't start really putting pen to paper until I have what I call that aha moment that moment where I see something where I'm either researching or I see something mentally that I say, that's what needs to come to life. That's what I need to bring out. Um, for the piece with the fish, I went to the Asian tea gardens in San Francisco. And as I was walking around, I noticed that there were all these different stone houses. And what I found out about them was that they were known as spirit houses where Loved ones that had passed over could reside in the Asian gardens. This was a tradition within the culture. Or they could also be um, for just spirits of keepers of the garden in some other cultures. But what I noticed was these were the geometric shapes that Kate was wanting. And it was something the piece had been made in memory of my sister, um, that little fish. And I said, here it is. I have a place to put that spirit, to put that little fish to swim in the thought of, okay, now I'm inspired. What am I gonna do with this? And so it became kind of a combination of all of these plus some real life pagoda structures. So now that I had the inspiration, now I got out the pen and paper. So it started with a sketch. And the first thing is, what is it gonna be? Is it gonna be a hat? Is it going to be a necklace? Is it going to be a bracelet? Well. The thought of doing a necklace with this and having a big solid structure around the neck seemed a, a little bit out of the spirit of what I was wanting to create. And so I said, what about a bracelet? Something that was on the wrist, something that you almost are holding um, this, this energy in your hand, but just a little cuff, it wouldn't be enough. And so creating a slave bracelet that went all the way over the hand that went about halfway up the arm seemed like something that would have enough room to create everything I wanted to within this piece. And so you can see this is where I started. The next thing is I had to think about the composition as I was doing this piece. And so often it's easy to say, oh, I love this bead. I'm going to put this over here. I'm going to put this over here. I want to put a flower over here. By the time you're done, there's so much going on that you can't see anything. It just looks like a pile of beads. And so 
one thing that I learned, I've been, I was a musician for several years. And one thing I learned as a musician was music isn't only the notes, it's the space between the notes. And the same thing is true of art. When I look at art, when I'm designing, it's not just the places where I have a big dragonfly or a flower, it's the spaces in between those as well. Something that leads your eye around the piece. And so you'll see this piece on the right that I created, Dream Helper. There's areas where I have a lot of beads, but they don't busy it to the eye. They're just a solid green and brown field in the background of the vine on the left. In addition, you have these white flowers. Again, they're kind of neutral, they disappear. And it allows the pink and purple dragonfly and the red ant at the bottom to <laughs> the right side, having the single branch that's, again, not distracting, doesn't overtake. You can still see the two little bugs. And then to balance it out, so that it wasn't just this empty strap on the one shoulder, just one little bee on the upper corner that sits right about the collarbone again, to bring the eye in, to balance it, to allow yourself to look at the whole piece that has an awful lot going on. But when you look at it, you see what I want you to see as a viewer. So it's something, you know, I see a lot of these um, big um, breastplates and show pieces that people do. And the ones that stand out and I remember the most are the ones where I look at them and yes, there may be a million things going on in it but I know exactly what the artist wanted me to see. Once we've got that designed in, it's time to figure out what beads we wanna use. And so as I look at this, I look at the different structures, the different colors. Do I wanna make it hyper-realistic? Do I wanna make it realistic? Um, looking at the lichen and the moss on the upper left corner picture of that spirit house, looking at the soft colors of a cherry blossom, you can see a real one front and center at the top and just to the left of it, I wanted to soften it a little bit so you can see the more muted beads. Um, even redoing things with different colors, you can see at the very bottom, the two different colors of bamboo, figuring out what I want the overall feel to be. And I'm gonna go over that in a minute in um, more depth. So you can see here that bamboo, when I did it first, the very first <laughs> of it was those, were those very bright colors. And it was distracting. It didn't fit. You can see the muted colors just beneath it of all the different moss and foliage that I wanted to represent the, the shoreline along the, the pond there. And so I redid it using the bamboo that you can see on the upper part which that bamboo is actually also the clasp. It's tubular peyote that's hollow and the clasp fits right between there. Kind of a hair, hair, uh, hairpin clasp. I'll show you that a little later. Um, so how do I figure out colors? How do I figure out what colors are going to go together? The easiest way is to go to your color wheel. And on the color wheel, you'll see on the left, um, there is colors that are opposite one another, which are considered complementary colors. If you want something to really pop out, use the complement. So if I'm doing something that's predominantly yellow, directly across from that is the red violet. What colors complement that? All the other colors with arrows that you see on that wheel are colors that I can put together in the same piece and they'll coordinate with the piece. They'll, they'll go with it, but they're not gonna make anything pop out. That's just gonna create a really nice palette of colors that go together. You can get one of these online. Um, there's all different companies that make them, but they're a wonderful tool to have. If I want to create shadows, though, one of the things that I do find I wanted to back up here is, for instance, if I'm doing a bright yellow piece, if I use the complement, not only will it bring out the yellow more, but it also will create a shadow, especially if I use a matte bead of the complementary color against a shiny one. Now, let's say the color wheel is just a little bit too complicated for you. Another thing I'll do is look at artwork that I really like. Here's a photograph and I'll say what colors are in it. So looking at this, you can see there's a lot of blues, uh, dark blues, light blues. So I might choose the two beads on the bottom, but the piece would be a little bit boring if I just kept it all in the blues. 
So one of the thing that I, things that I always say, if you really want a piece to sing, always choose what I call a fire color. And what I mean by a fire color is you'll have a neutral palette, but then choose that one color that really makes things pop. Now, copper would normally be a neutral, but because I'm using all these soft blues, putting that copper in, it becomes the fire color. So fire color doesn't need to be obnoxious, but it's just something that sings against the backgrounds of the other colors. So a really nice, fun design element for those of you who haven't worked with that. The next thing you got to consider is how beads will be affected by the different colors around them. Now the picture on the left, if you look at it closely, you'll see that those lines just to the side of each bead, so the upper left bead you'll see has green lines going through it, looks like it changes colors. But if you actually look at it and isolate that and go to the side, that line is the same color all the way across, the green line the same all the way across, the red one the same all the way across, the blue one the same all the way across but it looks like it's changing because of the environment that's around it. Beads do the same thing. If you look at, for instance, the butterfly that I did on the right-hand side, the brown kind of goldish brown beads that are in the butterfly are the exact same beads that are the gold green beads that are in the rope. By putting a bunch of green beads around it, it actually turned them green. By putting them next to the red beads, they turn brown. Again, it's how beads reflect each other and what you put next to it. So one way, you know, this was a, a class that I'm teaching. I didn't want to have students have to buy two different beads. So I used the green 24 karat gold iris bead. And voila, when I put it in the butterfly, it turned a brown gold. and the rope, it turned a green gold because of what's next to it. So as you're choosing your beads, this is a great way to, to get a color that maybe you're having a hard time finding that shade. Maybe you can change the color to be the shade you want by what you put next to it. Um, I'm going to move forward from here. I got some more stuff around this. The next thing I want you to think about is the shape of your beads. So if you look at the upper left uh, traditional Cellini spiral, in order to create it, each bead is a little bit bigger than the bead next to it, starting with size 15s, then I went to um, size 11s, then to some triangle 10s, and then to some size 8 beads. Looking at that, it's just this very nice smooth transition. So sometimes if I want to create something smooth, I'll just change the bead size. You still, even within that, have to look at the qualities of the bead. If you look at the bottom left petal, you'll see how it's very smooth. It, the curves are a little softer as opposed to right next to it, the waves of um, the bracelet there that are very angular and very sharp. Um, you can see the blue one there and also the um, one on the right hand side um, with the gold tips and the silver. So what I find is if I'm using a round bead, I'm going to get softer edges. That's not true with silver lined. Silver lined almost act like a silver bead because a lot of times the way that they're cut makes them a little sharper in their angle. So again, when you're choosing beads, look for beads that have softer rounded edges if you want something to be rounder. If you want something to be a little more angular and choppy like I wanted the waves to be, you can use that. And that was actually, um, the waves in there were inspired by Kath Thomas um, did a Kanagawa um, cuff years ago. And so seeing that, I liked the idea of it, but those waves only went in one direction. So um, I worked them to go multiple, but again, creating that choppy edge using cylinder beads. Um, looking at the one on the right-hand middle, you'll see that that one, again, uses cylinder beads to create those very sharp edges. And then talking about the shadow technique um, that I discussed a little bit earlier, you can see above the little duck bill there, there's matte beads that are um, a little duller, a little darker next to the orange beads of the back of the eye of the left eye. And again, it brought, brings them out, it makes them pop because you got something matte next to something shiny. So again, choose the bead you want 
to create the effects that you want. Also the brand of, brand of beads is gonna matter. The uh, ring on the left was made using Mayuki beads. Um, very soft, very gentle, um, very graceful. The right hand one, I wanted it to feel more like flames, a little more intense, a little fiery, fiery, a little sharper. And using Toho beads that were silver lined, I was able to get those straighter, longer edges. It's the exact same pattern, the exact same size beads, um, but the only difference is silver lined Toho versus Mayuki. And the Toho created a sharper, more dramatic fire, while the left one, the Mayuki made the softer. So knowing your brands of beads and what each of them is capable of doing and choosing the proper brand for the proper feel that you want to do. The next thing that I look at as well is the thread color and how am I going to use thread as a character in a piece. Um, the upper piece um, was done by um, a friend of mine, uh, Sarah Toussaint. It's um, a um, kaleidocycle that she had done. All the beads are clear except for the edge beads. And the only thing she changed was the thread color on each side. So allow your thread to be a character in your piece. And that's something that a lot of us, you know, we're taught hide your thread. Nobody should see your thread. But thread can be an element and can be a really positive driving force in a piece if you use it with, with, with cause, with, uh, with purpose. If you look at my bridge there to the right, you'll see little green threads poking through at the top. But if you notice on the side, um, right about the left-hand side of the picture, you can see a little bit of that red thread throwing through, showing through. <laughs> the whole piece was beaded with red thread, but I wanted to create some distress, some age in it. So I ran some green threads through in places just to create the optical illusion of perhaps some lichen or moss that might be growing in the cracks of the bridge. So again, the, the thread doesn't have to hide. Um, when you're doing craw or pra, um, the bottom left piece, um, you can see the thread is showing through. It's this light gray thread that just kind of ties everything together and softens it. The right hand bottom is some wisteria and you can see there's little threads hanging out. Um, there's white threads poking through. If you look at the bark of a wisteria tree, there's actually these stringy white slashes almost through the bark. And so I recreated that using the threads. So if I were to teach this as a class, most people would um, be horrified seeing the, that, but for my own artistic um, reflection, I left it white, but when I, um, share it with others, I teach it to them with green, <laughs> just so that it, it hides, because a lot of people aren't used to something that dramatic, they think it's a mistake. The next thing we've got to look at too is the different textures that different stitches make. When I'm choosing my stitches for a project, I'll look at it and I'll say, what, what do I want to, do I want it to be something that's a little more elegant, a little more royal, a little um, something that I might see embellishing like the walls of a castle, then I might do something like the right hand side netting that fits perfectly around the pearls. Um, the, the tension of this, it's, it's got a little bit of movement so you can wear it as a necklace, but it's stiff enough that it has body to it. If I wanted something to have that same feel but be a little looser, a little lighter, the necklace with the Chanel stitch right next to it has a similar feel, but again, is gonna have a lot more movement. So as I choose my stitches, I'm looking at how will it behave. Um, the, the upper left, um, the second one in, is herringbone done in a traditional way, but I just have a size 11 bead moving one step over in the ladder each row. And that creates a little bit more interest but also keeps it very clean, very smooth. Well, as the one to next to it is also herringbone, but done with a twist where every bead twist over, um, you go down two beads up one bead, um, for those of you who are familiar with twisted herringbone. And that creates a twist within the rope that again, mimics almost bark-like um, consistencies. Um, the bottom right, um, a lot of times when I want to build structures, I will use um, 
cubic right angle weave, it's great for just using building blocks. Um, the center bottom Hubble stitch is wonderful for lacy things, um, for things that you want to have a little bit of air, but also a lot of movement in. Um, which brings me to the next two examples. The bottom left, uh, the two figures, you've got the bamboo, which is done with tubular peyote, and the toggle bar, which is done with flat peyote. Um, a couple of years ago, I had an artist come to me and she said, I'm trying to create a piece. I want to do it all in peyote, but every time I do it, the whole thing collapses. It goes, <clears throat> the, the, the long tubes of peyote that I'm wanting to do just don't have the structure. And she said, do I need to put armature wires in or what, what would you recommend? And I said, well, if you take flat peyote and, you know, not too wide, but flat peyote, roll it on itself, you're going to get something that's much stiffer than if you did tubular peyote because of the way the beads are facing and your thread direction. And so she, she did that and it solved her problem. But if you look at this, a toggle bar, I don't want to have any flexibility. I want to be nice and rigid. So I'm going to do flat peyote and seam it together. On the left, the bamboo is I want it to have a little bit of bend so I can position it, have things come forward and backwards. So I did that one with regular tubular peyote. So again, think about the textures, the flow of the stitch, the grain of the stitch to figure out what would be best for the piece that I want to create. That said, your beads don't have to fit together great. Um, or it doesn't need to be this pristine um, fit. And one of the things that I found is if I want to create organic structured or weathered structures, you can see looking at the bottom, I, I, I can do a very pristine bridge but I wanted it to feel like it was falling apart. Um, hence the weaving in the, in the green threads, hence the, um, if you look at it, it's, it's pretty wonky. It goes up and down and it is in the pristine bridge. And again, by adjusting how I do the stitches, the tension, using the wrong size beads in the wrong places, um, can create a little bit of a wonky feel if you want something to feel uneven. Um, I did the same thing on the bottom right. Um, you can see the um, African helix stitch with the peanut beads. The peanut beads just don't sit well um, within the stitch, which created um, an almost collapse. Really, you can still see the stitch in there. You can see the spiral, but it's not pristine. And the reason for that is I wanted it to feel almost like little bird's nest or knots within the wood or in the vine. So again, do you want this to be pristine or do you want it to kind of fall apart? And then another thing, um, if you look at the upper right picture, this is a technique developed by Kathy King. Um, this is one of her pieces. And um, with the permission she allowed me to share this, you can see that the focus of the piece is on the sides of the beads. This is a technique that she calls bead quilling. So rather than obscuring the holes and trying to hide them within your piece, let them be the feature with the thread coming through as a feature as well. So start looking at your beads in new ways. They don't just have to be on their sides. Um, so one of the things that I've, that I've learned though, as I've been doing this is just because a shape doesn't exist in beading doesn't mean you can't make it. Uh, looking at this piece here, you can see the waves had never been done before I did this piece in this way, where they wave forward and backwards, sometimes in the same space. Um, the roof line, all of the horn shapes that you had seen in um, contemporary geometric beadwork, ha beadwork had an even increase with an even decrease and looked more like triangles pointing out versus a traditional pagoda rooftop. So, when I set out to do this, I said, how can I make this? And I didn't think, well, this hasn't been done before. I, it can't be done. I just figured out how to do it. And so don't let it's never been done before be an excuse to not push forward because you can get some really, really cool, fun stuff. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So now that we've done this, we've got our beads chosen, our colors chosen for those beads. We've got the idea down, we've done the research, we know what this piece is all about, we're inspired. Now we've got to figure out how are we going to pattern this. And so looking at this, I have a couple different ways that I pattern. 
The first way that I pattern is I will do a step, take a photograph of it, and then on that photograph, I'll write down what I did. So that way I can come back to it later. There's nothing worse than you create something. You're like, okay, now how did I do that? And you're trying to cut it apart and figure out how you did that. And so um, a lot of times I'll just take a photo, write down on the photo using the app what I did for that. And I'm horrible at writing my own patterns. I'm not very tech savvy. So what I do is I take these pictures, I give them to my husband, and he will um, 3D render everything um, for my um, patterns. So he gets this piece. He's an incredible beater, by the way, but um, prefers to be digitally versus um, with a needle and thread. So I give him this picture, and this picture becomes um, the actual pattern. So that's one way I do it. And I'll show you that on the next slide. The other way that I'll do it is, let's say I'm doing a 3D peyote piece. I'm not going to photograph you know, 40, 50, 60 rows that each one is, you know, I added two beads here. So instead I'll write kind of a recipe. And when I'm done, I'll take that recipe and put it aside, usually for about a week or two, come back and then I'll rebeat it to make sure that I didn't make any mistakes in it because it's so often to, oh, I forgot to write this row. And so once I know that it's right, then again, I'll send it over to my husband and he'll make it into a pattern but I start off by just writing a flow chart of what I did line by line, okay? So the piece on the right, pay attention to it and you're gonna notice the upper left is the rendering of it with the next row added to it of the netting. So we take that photograph and then build it digitally and then row by row, I just add in more beads or have him add in more beads. So that's one way of doing it with the 3D field. For those of you who are not as tech savvy, myself included, another way to do this would be the middle of the one that says figure 19. What that does is it allows you to kind of do it more like a spreadsheet. You can see that this is right angle weave done in a circle with peyote going through that. Um, so again, another way of patterning is to figure out, okay, I can't do this 3D. That's a little bit beyond my skill, but you can still do it as this kind of dot chart, um, like figure 19. Um, the bottom is, um, I'll go over that a little later, we've been able to start working in 3D and you can see the full 3D pattern with um, the beads in perspective and I'll get into how I do that. Now, if you're like me and you're not tech savvy at all, um, I started off the bottom left, that's how I would draw a pattern. So this was how I was doing cubic right angle weave for one of my flowers. And I said, okay, the back, the top and bottom need to be size 15s. I need delicas where there's the dark diamonds and 11s um, where there's the big open circles. So again, however it works for you, write it down so you can reproduce it later. Now, the next technique that I learned for patterning, I actually learned from um, Hyde Peterson. And what it is, is you know, take a piece of peyote graph paper and I either take um, a picture that I find online, um, this um, the one on the bottom left of these dragonfly wings. I just superimposed it over some graph paper and you can find peyote graph paper online from all different um, sources for free. Um, and I just play, placed them on top with some transparency, printed that out and then I colored in each square um, each little circle bead there to figure out how I wanted the pattern to be. Um, you can also just print this out and trace with the actual, um, if you got like plastic wings or something like that from a kid's toy. One of the things that I found when I did this though, is if you try to capture too many details, it can get a little clunky and busy. So if you look at the dragonfly in the middle, those wings are very thick, very dark, very heavy. They don't have the light dragonfly feel. So what I did was I went back to the drawing board and I noticed that there were kind of um, these long stripes on a diagonal. If you look at the wing on the bottom left, you'll see these kind of long stripes here going along. And so I captured just the long stripes to give the feel of movement and the dragonfly on the right was born that was a lot softer and fit the other um, creatures that it was gonna be put with in that bracelet. 
The next problem that I run into though is what if I wanna make something a little more 3D, but I still need to trace. So one of the things that I found is if I use um, diagonal peyote and connect some of the center beads, the beads here on the increases, it will allow it to create a little bit of a curve, a little bit of a cupping sensation. But to know how much, what I'll do is I'll take a pattern on a piece of paper, I'll cut that paper and I'll just start bringing it together at different levels until I see how if I were to bring beads from one side to another side, how it's gonna affect the overall shape once I've got that down, that, that sets the pattern up. I know where it needs to connect and then I can, again, trace over the paper and you can see the drawing on the left became the drawing on the right. So a really fun way, this also works if let's say you just wanna see how things will work in layers, I can make all my different pattern pieces and stack them together like a collage and I can see how will my flower sit on top of my leaf? How will my wings sit on my bug? And um, this is a really good way to really compose everything on paper before you go to beads. Um, I'll also trace from the actual plant. Um, so I took, I actually have this orchid in my office right now, it's in bloom, um, but I'll take the orchid and I pull apart petal by petal trace it on paper there. And then what I do is I take strings of beads and figure out how many beads tall it is. Um, so um, you'll see top um, 11, right? Um, basically, this let me know which petal it is. And then after this, I went back and I actually wrote how many beads tall each section was. So I know how big to make each part. And then I did what I considered a sketch of this. And I gave the sketch to my daughter um, at um, her first birthday for her photos. Um, and I'll give it to her when she's uh, turned 16. So it's gonna be my gift to her. <clears throat> but this initial onset was just to figure out how can I make the beads curve? What, what would it take to, to make an orchid? And there were some things that I loved about it and some things that I noticed didn't capture the shapes. So I went back to what stitches can I use to make what state, what, what shape, um, kind of what I discussed a little bit earlier. And what came from that is, first of all, I wanted to switch orchids because this didn't have the veins as present. And um, once I did that, I was able to retrace it and bring in as many of the lines as I could. And this became the final version here. And there's 14 different stitches in it to create all the subtle shapes of an orchid. So, you know, again, this came with that piecing together of the graph paper where I did each petal individually, saw how it would curve by how I angled the graph paper and put it all together. And this is what it created. So again, doing a collage of it before it goes to its final version. Another way that I'll do it, if um, orchids wither a little quickly, um, but daisies don't. So um, this piece I had done um, for my mother-in-law. She and I had always had kind of a contentious relationship. And so as a Mother's Day gift, one year in a peace offering, I um, did this piece, um, Gerber daisies are her favorite and she actually sells flowers at farmer's markets. So, Kind of capturing her passion and um, Beat and Button magazine had asked me to do a piece for them um, to show in their inspiration page. So for Mother's Day, um, it was in that issue, um, pulled a, did this, the, the, this piece and to pattern it, I pulled off a petal and beaded right on top of that petal, as you can see on the bottom right, petal by petal, and was able to create the overall petal shape. Now the center, um, there was no way to pull it apart. So I took a pair of calipers, like you measure the width of a bead and um, said, okay, this is about 18 millimeters, a little bit more. Um, so by the time I bezel it, um, this will be perfect. You get this side just crystal, do this many rows. And I was able to just measure it out using a pair of calipers and create the center of the flower, which you can see in the upper right, and then put that all together into the left. And I'll discuss a little bit about how we do construction in a little bit here. Actually, the next slide. So 
one of the ways that you know, I said, okay, so now I have all these components, how do I put this together? So if you look at the actual construction of the flower here, for instance, you'll see that in the center, you've got this tall column right here in the middle here. And on the sides of that, you have all of the different um, stamen. You have the stigma on the top going around the, the edging here. You can see it right around here. And then you have the petals in several rows. So what creates several rows of petals? Well, the easiest way to do that is a stitch that will have openings for several rows to be inserted with spaces. And so cubic right angle weave became my stitch of choice there because there's a big gapping in between each bead there that would hold the petals. The center to make a nice column that I could build a bezel that would hold a crystal for it, I said, what would be better than to do just right straight up peyote, to be, do a tube of peyote. You can see I get a little bit narrower here using some Czech Charlottes. So it's not as visible to the eye, but it does mimic the actual flower. Sucks it in, can hold your crystal. You come out to the top to create the different stigma. We popped in little size 11 beads right around the top that allowed for the kind of studying, but also created a really pretty embellishment. Added some pearls for some bling and then put all of the fringing around it to represent the stamen. So again, using the flower's actual anatomy to figure out how I'd put something together. And this could be, maybe you're building a clock that you wanna do. How is a clock slotted together? How is the wood? How does it come together? Use those same techniques, but just do it in beads, okay? Now, one of the things that I've uh, found is as I bead, sometimes things don't work the, say, the way you thought they would. Um, when I was doing that pagoda, one of the things that I noticed was the original design. You can see where the yellow lines are. Those were the bars that were gonna hold up the crystals. And then from the, those little beams, those little bars, there were gonna be cross beams going down on a diagonal to kind of look like scaffolding to hold it up. But by the time I would add that, I would have been another inch down the wrist. And so I had to do an editing process. And so what I did was I, I was looking and I said, this doesn't look like it's going to work. So I took a photograph with my phone and then just finger drew on my phone where I thought everything would go rather than sitting there with the computer and typing everything out and drawing. This was just a quick finger sketch over the top. And I said, okay, proportions, the most I'm gonna get in are these few things. They're not gonna get in the bars and I'm just gonna go with it. And so you can see here the sketch, and then that's what it became right beneath it. Another thing that um, I'll do is a lot of times when I'm using cubic right angle weave, I've got to figure out how the different things are going to angle or shape. So I wanted to create a pair of spurs here is what this is. Um, there are a pair of spur, spur earrings. There's, I want to say like 160 crystals in this little pair of earrings here. Um, I gave it away at the beginning of um, at the beginning of sheltering in place last year. I actually posted this for a month online and gave it away for free as a pattern for everybody on that downloaded it. And one of the things that I had to figure out is how can I create the the shank of the spurs, the kind of angles that kind of come across here at different um, points. So what I did was I took my daughter's toys. Um, and if you look at these, wherever there's a magnet, that's where a bead would go. The overall shape is your thread path. And so, okay, three-sided pra going to four-sided cra, going back to three-sided creates the exact shape that I needed. I planned that out. And then I did the actual stitches, figured out how many stitches between, because I didn't want it to be huge here. And I was able to figure out the thread paths, the shapes, and everything before I actually went to beading and how it would work, okay? So this is a great way to plan out craw because it's basically building blocks. Another way that I'll do it, if I wanna just go free form and I don't wanna have a lot of planning, is I'm gonna look at overall, what is the total length of whatever it is I wanna create? 
and I'll string up that many beads so I know how long or how many rows that I'm going to be allowed to do to, in order to create that this piece. Then I'm going to divide it. And I'll take a photograph of it and I'll divide it. You can see these dividing lines here of about how much of the overall percentage of beads am I going to have room to do on the piece. And then I just freeform it. I say, okay, I need to have it create a hump here, come back down here, not going to be able to get all the details. It's not going to be perfect, but I'm going to try to get the overall feel. And so you can see here how I planned out how this dragonfly would work out with the thicker thorax area, kind of the abdomen area where it starts to taper in, and then the tail, and figuring out how that would be overall. And then the wings actually are just about the same length as the body. And then so when I was planning the wings, I traced that, which you saw the tracing a little bit earlier in the piece, in the, in the presentation. So again, this is another great way to work. Just divide out the overall, space it out, and then bead just that far, just the next section and the last section. You'll see it works out almost perfectly almost every time. And then, as I mentioned earlier, if a shape doesn't exist, don't give up. <laughs> um, figure out another way. So, you know, there's um, kind of talk, a single needle right angle weave has existed for, for, for centuries, really. But um, along comes um, Nancy Meinhardt and David Chad about the same time, um, and a few other people who rediscovered single needle right angle weave. And um, David Chad started making it pretty popular. And he said, what happens if I wanted to make cubes though, to build on each other? Because cubic right angle weave hadn't existed. And so he started playing with it and making not only just this one-sided right angle weave, but the cubes that we now use for cubic right angle weave all over the world. So that didn't exist until he saw a problem and said, how do I fix it? For me, looking at the top of the roof line here, this shape didn't exist in be the beading world when I wanted to make this. But I remembered this old mandala that um, you see in all different cultures all over the world. I've seen it in um, different um, uh, Hindu cultures. I've seen it um, in Egyptian tombs. Um, Native Americans use it as their cloud design, the repeating stack triangles. So I said, what's the math behind it? How does it work? So my dad was a math teacher. Um, took out my old geometry books and figured out, okay, what shape is this? What are the angles? Um, how many beads would it take to go from the center line here to the outer tip? How many would it take to go down? How many rows would that take? Did the math, took out the beads and it worked. And so again, figuring out how can I make this happen even though it doesn't exist? And that same shape there got repeated here to make the beams. And then when I got down here, I said, how do you make waves? How do you create direction? So I looked at Kath Thomas's work um, and her, um, what she called her Kanagawa bracelet, I believe it um, was called. And what she did was she had a moving increase. So rather than increases being stacked on each other, like in contemporary work, it would change by one space with every single row. And I said, so that's how you create it one way. How do I create it both ways simultaneously? And well, if I need something to go two different directions, I have to do an increase and then an increase right beneath it and then simultaneously have one grow one direction and one go the other. So it was basically growing one stitch before for the one part of the wave and growing one stitch in front of for the other part of the way. And suddenly now it's flip-flopping back and forth as you can see in the picture. So again, I didn't look at it as a problem. And probably it was also my um, being a rookie back then. Again, this was the very first piece I ever designed. And so my ignorance was my bliss. I didn't realize I wasn't supposed to know how to do this, that it didn't exist. And so I just figured it was an experience that was creating the little gaps. And I figured out how to make something happen rather than getting stressed about how am I going to make this happen. And I think a lot of times there's a lesson in that. How many times do you psych yourself out and say, oh my God, that looks so complicated. I can never do that. You know, if let's break down this piece. Um, looking at this, most of us have bezeled a crystal before. Most of us have done a strip of craw before. 
most of us have done a peyote increase at some point in our life. So when I think of it that way, and I don't think of I've got to build the whole roof line with crystals underneath it, no. It's piece by piece by piece and putting it together. There's that old saying, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. That's exactly what this is, is it, don't get overwhelmed. Just, you know, beads, there's only really one way to bead. You put a needle through a hole in a piece of glass and you string it to the next piece of glass that has a hole in it. That's about all you can do. And maybe you pick up two at once, maybe you pick up one at once, but all you're ever doing is picking up one bead at a time. And so when we think of it that way, beading is never hard. You may not understand where you need to go next or what the artist meant in their pattern, but if you sit and you breathe and you say, I'm just picking up a bead, putting a needle through a hole, it gets a lot less stressful. It really does. That said, once you finally get ready to put all this together, you can see that was my tracing of the dragonfly wing. You got my lotus petal. You've got my roof line. You've got my flow chart for how I created each insect there. It's OK to use a bunch of different methods all at once. You don't have to stick to, OK, well, because this piece I'm using a menu, you got to use a menu for the whole thing. Each element can have a different way of putting it together, OK? I will do freeform a lot, but for instance, on the Lotus, I knew that I needed to be able to have every single petal match up to the one next to it. So for this one, again, I'm going to um, pattern it out and then I can reproduce it all the way around. So another way that I work, that's the, that's the meaty way of working, but I tend to be a little more organic in how I produce things. So when I started, it was, let's get out the graph paper, let's create the word charts. But then when I wanted to start having fun. So I made all these flowers. I wanted them to sit as a slave bracelet over the hand. So what I did was I took a photograph of everything I'd already made, laid the flowers out, and then I drew the branches where they needed to be to hold, to hold the flowers. What's great about this is now I know kind of the roadmap of what I need to create but there's a different problem here that I ran into. I couldn't just bead over the top of that because it didn't allow for 3D space. It didn't allow for the bracelet that had to wrap around, you know, wrap around my hand. It didn't allow for it to go around the finger. So how did I create something that had the 3D space? And then it hit me. I bought a 3D pen. And so I used the picture as my layout and took this 3D pen and you can buy these for like 20 bucks on Amazon. And you feed the filament, same filament that they use to do 3D printing, stick it right in the back end of the pen and you can draw in space right over the top of the form. And I got all the depth, all the shape, all the lengths that everything needed to be in order to create, you can see on the right, the piece and what I did was beaded right on top of it, just like I traced that flower petal um, that I showed you earlier for the Gerber daisy. I did the exact same thing here. Um, the one, one caution if you go to do this, the um, element, the tip of it gets really, really hot. So um, think of it like a thread burner. If it gets too close to your piece, you're gonna burn it and everything's gonna fall apart. So when I got up towards the tip of it, I just kind of slid the bracelet out of the way, filled in the blanks and then kind of brought it back to make sure it matched. Another thing you can do now, 3D printers have come down. Let's say I wanted to make a little critter, a little teddy bear or something. Rather than having to make stuffing, if you're a computer savvy, you can make a 3D teddy bear, print it out, and then bead right on top of it, make a little net and encase the entire thing. And now you've created your entire pattern, write down what you did as you were doing that, encasing it, and now you can reproduce the whole thing without the filling, the 3D filling, okay? So yes, you're gonna have to make it twice, but the second time always goes twice as fast, okay? So kind of another fun way of thinking about it as you're working. Um, if you're skilled in other areas, bring those in. Um, if you look here, 
that little hairpin that I talked about um, earlier with the bamboo, what I did was I took a piece of 14 karat gold wire, it's real gold. Um, I bent it, stuck it through a rolling mill, hammered it, um, took my, um, let's see, that, oh, it's out of the room right now. Um, I have a flex shaft, a, a metal working tool, high polished it, um, hammered it again, and was able to create the shape that works perfectly in the bracelet. Um, the left hand side, you can see the wire work in the middle here was all done using an Egyptian spiral wire work to do the axle for these spurs. Just a different colorway of the copper one I showed earlier. Or I also enjoy doing chain mail. And so this is called shaggy scale when you do it this way using beetle wings um, that are chain mailed on there using shaggy scale techniques. So kind of combine other things that you may know to embellish your work and it can be a lot of fun. Now, one of the last ways of patterning, and this is one again that I have to send to my husband because I'm not as skilled as he is, but about a year ago, um, um, Adobe, it was August, um, not last year, but the year before, so a year and a half now, came out with a program called Adobe Dimension. And in this program, it's part of the Adobe suite for those who have like Illustrator and those, it comes with it. You can actually do computer aided drafting and create 3D models of these are, that's the cap of those pearl tassel earrings that I showed earlier. Um, and what's great about this is that you can rotate the image and see it from any angle. What's bad about this is one, you can't draw the thread pass in this program. So what I do is I create in this program, figure out how the beads will fit together, find the angle that shows the stitch from the best point of view. And then I um, draw the thread pass in, in Illustrator. But you can see here that you can actually move your patterns in 3D space to see what's going on all around. It's a really cool feature. And so every pattern that I did that's a 3D pattern like this, as of January of um, 2020, this is how I pattern. So if a student gets stuck, all I have to do is say, oh, no problem, let me send you this file. There's a free program to view it on your phone. And um, they can open it up and say, oh, that bead fits there on the back. And they can actually see it in 3D space from every angle, zoom in, zoom out. Um, and so, Again, this is part of the Adobe suite. So for those of you who are tech savvy, this is a really good alternative. That said, you can plan and you can plan and you can plan. But you know, there's an old saying, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Um, as I showed earlier, I thought that the proportions that I'd be able to get the beams in for, for the roof line. Here I am trying to capture this roof that's in this picture. You can see the beams underneath couldn't do any of that because of the limits of the, basically of the proportions of beads. So I started saying, okay, this is following that math, the math, the math of that one, but it wasn't creating that sloping roof line that I wanted. This one though, I really liked the shape of it and the overall feel. So it became the basics of a class that I wrote like two years later. So never throw out your mistakes. I call it my sketch pad. I just have this big bowl with all of my things that didn't work how I thought they would. And a year later, it may come out again um, when I'm trying to create something else, which is what this was. But when I tried it again, I was able to create all the different shapes over the top of it. Um, one of the things here, I use Delicas here. Um, Delicas are beautiful. They um, make some wonderful shapes, but it wasn't pristine enough. I wanted it to feel really just man-made and just those perfect lines. And the Icos did that. And so here, this is all Ico. And the lower part where I wanted it to feel more organic and a little wonky, I used the Delicas. So again, understanding your sketch pad and how to do it. And also when you do something that doesn't work, put it aside, where was it working? Where wasn't it working? And come back to it. That said, even if you design it right, proportions may not work, the pattern may not work. Um, that butterfly that I showed you a little earlier where the brown beads look brown in one area and green in another. What I found was it took eight different tries per wing to figure out the thread color, 
to figure out what beads would show up better next to other beads, to um, figure out the overall shapes. So again, every wing took eight tries and they're all in the sketch pad, they're ready to go. Perhaps a different butterfly will need those proportions or those shapes or those striations. So again, nothing is wasted here. Um, the other thing, for those of you who bead, and this is kind of a side note, if you've ever put two beads next to each other and one doesn't show up, um, I'm sure all of us have had this happen. The very first thing that I do um, before I even stitch them together to see if they might have a problem is take the pic a picture of the beads in black and white on your phone. So take a regular color picture, then there's a filter option that says change to black and white. Click on that and look at it. If you can see the different colors, you will be able to see the different colors in the weave. Um, it's a really good tip. Um, if you don't see the colors, but you still really want to use those two colors side by side, change the finish of one of the two beads. So for instance, do one in opaque, one in translucent, then it will show up. Do one in translucent, do one in silver lined, then the two will show up side by side. Okay, so if you still want to do it, um, that's kind of a little side tip there. Okay. The next thing is now you've created all the elements for your piece. Now you got to put it together. And in my original drawing, the bridge was on the left. When I did that, it didn't fit right. It kind of went upwards. It, um, it didn't feel organic. It was fighting the fish. And I realized I had to switch sides. And once I did that, you can see there was more room for the bamboo um, and everything flowed together. I had room to create the center bar across the top and still have the bamboo going through it. So again, listen to your piece, listen to the beads. You may think you're making a bird and it ends up a frog. Be happy you made a frog, you just learned how, and the bird needs to come later. It's just the universe and the beads telling you it's your time to make a frog, not a, beard, not a bird. And again, the more you listen to it, the placement of the beads, and you don't fight the process, the, the better time you're gonna have overall. So that said, this is the last slide. This is the final piece, what it became. Had I thought that I was going to do every single one of these elements, I would have never started. It would have been overwhelming. But when I looked at it as, oh, I can make a petal. Oh, I can make another petal. Oh, I can make a bezeled crystal. That's when the piece became doable. And so whenever you're looking at any pattern you're doing, when the whole pattern seems overwhelming, you're just picking up a bead, this hollow thing, putting a needle through it and going to the next one you're just making a wing, you're just making a petal, you're just making a bezel crystal, you're just making a bar, a beam, whatever it is. And when you start breaking it down piece by piece and put it all together, it's a lot less overwhelming. Um, for me as a designer, um, this again was my first piece that I ever did on my own. And had I looked at the overall picture, this would have never happened. Yes, it was a sketch, but then I took it component by component and this was born, okay? So hopefully that gives you guys kind of a little insight. I could probably do an hour talk on every single one of these slides, but um, hopefully this gave you just a little overview of my design process and gave you some ideas of what you could do. Um, if you do have any questions, my email is here. You can visit my website to see some of my different creations. If you want to try something, you can go to my um, web store. I just have that flower that you saw, the Gerber daisy and the little crawling ant on there right now. Um, uh, the pearl earrings are coming in about two or three months. Um, but um, in general, um, if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to ask me now. Um, we're going to open up the floor for questions with uh, Rochelle or um, send me an email. But thank you all very much um, for staying with me. So Rochelle, hello. Do you have any questions for me? Yeah, well, we've got a couple people that are just, everybody is just so amazed by your design process and how inspirational it's been. And um, 
I, I just am really amazed at the detail of, you know, pedal by pedal. And that's how, and yeah, you broke it down so simple. How could we not all do this, right? Yes. And that's really what it is. I, I hope for those of you that have hit roadblocks that you can sit back and say, you know, I made this little shape here, a pedal, but that pedal could become a cat ear. Mm -hmm. So I've made a pedal. Why can't it be the same shape as the ears of my cat? I made this other pedal here. It looks like an elephant ear. You know, again, looking at things a little differently. Does anybody have any questions for Cliff? You can unmute yourself and I'll ask. I'll never get used to the sight of it. This is Tia. I really don't have it. You don't have a question, but you'd like to say something to Cliff? Yes. Excellent presentation. Thank you, Cliff. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for sitting here with me for the last a little over an hour. So thank you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, Cliff, I'm kind of new, like I, understanding um, working off shapes to create, like you said, waves and stuff, increasing to some point and then decreasing. Yes. Do you recommend like maybe just practicing doing some of those types elements just to see what you can create so you understand yes. um, how you can maybe create different shapes or... What I did to teach myself was I started off with a regular tube of peyote. And then I just put a single increase and then kept going without increasing again to see how it affected the overall shape. And what I found was it just raised it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Then I tried that with a different style bead. And what you're gonna find, so I did that with a round bead, then I tried it with like a Delica or with an Ico. Mm -hmm. And I saw that the angle was a little sharper. Then what happened when I put one on top of the other? So seeing how the overall shape is affected and then how can I keep it? Because what happens is beads want to go to round, but mm -hmm. the second you put an increase like that in, they go to oval or diamond or whatever. And how do I pull it back to round? Mm -hmm. I found when I did a row of craw, it created a break within the pattern that allowed it to go back to round. And so figuring out as I put stitches next to one another, how it affected the stitches after. And it was just trial and error. And don't be scared to make a mistake mm -hmm. because all you have to do is either put it in your sketchbook for later, you know, that little bowl that I hope all of you will have now, or you cut it apart and what was the cost, you know, 10 cents worth of string. Mm -hmm. And it was a great learning experience. So don't be scared of making mistakes, be excited about every everything that didn't work how you thought was another learning experience of what else you can make. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? <laughs> We're just uh, in Cliff, awe. <laughs> Cliff, before everybody signs off, this is Maggie. Hi, I Maggie. want to thank you so much for spending your time with us. Um, yeah, I think we're all pretty um, speechless with admiration. <laughs> <laughs> so Thank you, Maggie. My hope, is, my hope is that, you know, I don't think everybody out here is gonna go and get a 3D printer, <laughs> but perhaps, oh, I never thought of tracing. Oh, I never thought of doing this with, um, you know, opacity on my computer and printing it out and then creating a pattern. I never thought of just making a recipe and, you know, seeing as I want that I needed to go five rows with increases, four rows with decreases, looking at the percentage. So hopefully this gave you different ways of looking at this presentation, you know, different ways of patterning, different ways of choosing your colors, et cetera, that hopefully will help you create something um, that you really are setting out to do. Well, so tell I, us just I think a tiny you... bit about the stitch you're going to teach us on March 20th oh, uh, for our Beading Life Saturday. Um, let me give me one second here. I'm going to um, find the stitch for you all, hopefully. Um, nothing's ever handy, right, when you're looking for it. So the stitch that I showed you all in that butterfly necklace 
we're going to be teaching it to you. It works great as even just a um, just a simple bracelet. But it looks like um, looking at it, it looks like just a bunch of right angle weave. But if you look, do you see all these little spaces in between? Mm -hmm. It's all netted. It's, so it's like a spiraling emra, and it was an ancient stitch from um, uh, kind of an Indo-Chinese uh, that was used in, in those regions and um, was never documented, was never written down with um, a name to it. So I'm calling it Indo-Chinese box stitch, but it's this very supple um, kind of lacy version of, even lacier version than a right angle weave normally is that creates just a really fun pattern that whips up pretty quickly to make some nice bracelets or neck ropes. Yeah, that's super cool. Uh -huh, thank you. <laughs> so I'll be teaching that on the 20th, correct? Yeah, um, our beading live Saturday, March 20th. It's the first day of spring. And so we want to spring into something new here. <laughs> and uh, members um, of the group will be getting um, uh, digital copies of the pattern in order to create the rope. Not the whole butterfly, but just the rope part. Um, so that way you'll be able to reproduce and make your own bracelets and have a digital copy. And that will be for all members that um, would like. So we'll be getting that out to the members before our beading session. So then you'll be able to bead along with us. And that March 20th as well, Doris Coghill will be teaching a it's like a star component and you can do it one dimensional, two dimensional or three dimensional. And it uses a lot of fire polish or bicone crystals, she says. And then I'll be teaching your basic, um, what do you call it? Daisy stitch. So if you all haven't done it for a while, um, this is the traditional one where the leaves are in between the daisies. So you could do pretty much anything you like with it. Um, depending on the size of the beads you want to use, um, 11s or 8s or 6s. Um, yeah, so my choker is made out of 8s. Um, but it's a fun daisy stitch and it's with the leaves in between. So it's the traditional zigzag pattern. So we've got a lot of fun things for March 20th, beading live Saturday 1 to 4. So watch on the Upper Midwest Bead Society page or the Bobby Bead page and we'll be beading live and we'll be putting all the ingredient lists, supply lists so that you can bead along with us for Doris's project, my project and Cliff's project that day. Yeah. And so any other announcements, questions for Cliff? We've got a whole lot of thank yous going on in our comments and everything. And so, yeah, everyone is just super blown away, Cliff. And so thank we're you. very inspired to see what you do this year for the Toho 2021 challenge. I'm um, having a lot of fun with it. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Cause yeah, what you've done the last couple of years is amazing. So, and if you haven't seen it, we do have cliffs that he showed first, the waiting for the rain. It's here at Bobby Bead, the little, um, what kind of creature is that? Is it a wallaby? A wallaby, okay. Yes. It's oh, yeah. adorable. And it's on the Lazy Susan here, so you could spin it around and get a little close. So if you want to come into Bobby Bead and see what's left of the 2021, 2020 challenge before we send them off, um, it'll be here for another month. There it is, that one, waiting for the rain. And so, yeah, we've got it here at Bobby Bead. Thank you, Cliff. It was fantastic. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone, for... Um, Spending the last hour and a half oh, with me. It was it fun. Was great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. See you Saturday. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. You have a good night. We'll see you, you next time. Bye bye. So.